I have a bit of a confession to make. I wasn't always a Giga Chad at Flesh and Blood. In fact, when I first started, I was pretty damn bad. I kept finding myself getting behind in games and I would get to this point where I was forced to block my opponent's attacks and so they would be able to just send their full hand at me while I had to give mine up to try and stay alive and obviously that never really worked. And for the longest time, I couldn't figure out exactly what the issue was and how I kept getting in those situations. But now, after a couple years of playing, I know what my issue was and it was that I was completely undervaluing and misusing the most important resource in all of flesh and blood, life total. When it comes to trading card games, exchanging a bit of life for some sort of effect or resource has been around forever. For a long time now, games like Magic the Gathering and Yu-Gi-Oh have had plenty of cards and effects that cost life to activate giving you an advantage over the opponent. Whether it's to gain better resources, stop your opponents in their tracks, or simply deal some damage, life total isn't just a win condition, it's a crucial resource. But the thing is, in Flesh and Blood, life total affects your resources a bit different than it does in a game like Magic or Yu-Gi-Oh. See, those are resource building games. Whether it's in the course of several turns or a 10 minute game of Solitaire, the goal of those games is to typically build a board state that's better than your opponents so that you can completely outvalue them. Even if a player is at one life the opponent is still at full, if that lower life player has a much, much superior board state, they're probably going to win the game. But Flesh and Blood isn't a resource building game. It's a fantasy fighting game. Flesh and Blood works very differently than a lot of other card games in two distinct ways. The first is that there are very few cards that only do one thing. Most cards in Fab can do a combination of attacking, blocking, be played for their abilities, or be pitched for resources. Most actions in this game come from the hand rather than a maintained board state. Aside from equipment, there's usually very little if anything on board, and even with heroes like Dash or Dromai who can make a board state, they still need cards in hand for resources to actually do anything with it. And this is made significant by the other way that Flesh and Blood works differently from other games. In most games, you start with an opening hand and you draw a card at the start of every turn. But in Flesh and Blood, you draw up to your full hand at the end of each of your turns. This gives both players a consistent amount of resources, but it's what you do with them in these turn cycles that makes the difference. Let's say you're playing Dorinthia and your friend is on Bravo. He's coming in for six with the Nothos. If you, as Dory, are at 22 life, you can just easily take that damage and keep your full hand to swing back with. But when you're at just two life, well, you've got to block with two cards to not die. But if you do block, then you can't have a good enough turn to swing the tempo back in your favor. Simply put, your life total is going to dictate each and every decision that you make. And this makes sense thematically, because if you're fighting to the death, then how hurt you are is going to change how you approach the fight. For this video, I've broken Flesh and Blood down into a general range of four zones that players will find themselves in, all based on life total. These zones are the power zone at 40 to 20 life, the caution zone at 20 to 10, pressure zone at 10 to 5, and finally the kill zone at 5 to 1. Now to be clear, these zones aren't a perfect science. Different heroes and matchups can have different ranges, but I think that this breakdown works as a good general template to use, even if it's not perfect. For example, a Kano player doesn't really care what life you're at. Kano will just deal you 50 kajillion damage on turn two because they lucked into a couple Aether wildfires. But it's okay because Kano's not real and he can't hurt me. From the top, we have where every classic constructed game starts. Both players are completely fresh, they have all their equipment, and they are both in the power zone. And both players being at their full power is why I decided to call this the power zone. But it's also because this is the life range where people are most likely to use their power turns. For those of you who may be newer to Flesh and Blood, a power turn is simply the turn where a player outputs far more damage than average, usually facilitated by drawing extra cards. Think Lexi after playing a three of a kind, Phi after an Art of War, and Viserai after a Cash-In. Each of these heroes can easily push 20 to 25 damage on these turns, and sometimes even more if they get a little lucky in the process. However, in order to take one of these power turns, heroes usually need all four cards in hand, and oftentimes also an arsenal card from their previous turn. You can tell when somebody's going to do a power turn because they'll usually throw their hands up and say, I'm not blocking anything, so they can turn around the next turn and deal you an insane amount of damage. But not every deck has power turns. Some decks want to block more and keep their life total high, and they'll even do things like pitch their attack reactions early game so that they can use them in the late game. 
Decks like Islander or Bravo don't typically have super high damage power turns pushing over 20. Instead, these heroes are willing to block damage and chip back a little bit, waiting for an opening to use. But even if you try to get the upper hand on these heroes, they can stop you in your tracks with something like a crush effect or some frost bites. Going back to the Dory and Bravo game, let's say Dory just had one of her most powerful turns. Utilizing Glistening Steel Blade and Iron Song Determination to hit the Bravo player twice, the Dawn Blade now has two counters from the Glistening and one from its own ability. And while this turn didn't deal upwards of 20 damage, having the Dawnblade now swing for 6 is incredibly strong and puts Dorinthia in a position where she can maintain dominance. Except the Bravo player has something up their sleeve too, a Spinal Crush and Arsenal. And their hand is 3 blues and a red pummel, and this is the last thing a Dorinthia player wants to face, especially after just acquiring 3 Dawnblade counters. Bravo has 9 resources here, which is enough to use his ability, attack with the Spinal Crush for 9 with Dominate, and pummel the attack, pumping it to 13. Even if Dorinthia has her full suite of armor left, she can only block 10, and will stop the crush effect, but will have to then discard to the pummel. This means that she'll lose 2 cards from hand no matter what, and even if she has a Steel Blade Shunt, she has to pay for it, which means she's still losing 2 cards in hand. And obviously she just takes the damage, Spinal Crush removing Go Again ruins her turn too, so that's a bad option. Option as well. If this was just raw damage, she could just take it and continue her onslaught. But Bravo choosing to do just that himself means that he now has the power to destroy all the progress that she had made on her previous turn. This is why having the choice to take damage instead of blocking is so important. But don't take this to mean that you should never block. In fact, I see a lot of players making the mistake of either blocking too much or not blocking enough in the power zone, and I think it's costing people more games than they realize. You really need to consider whether it's worth it or not to take damage, and if you can output more on your own turn, and if that's even worth it. If your opponent is presenting 17 damage and you can only present 12, then you're probably going to want to block. But even if you're dealing 21 as opposed to their 17, it also doesn't really matter if after all that damage you're going to 4 and they're going to still be at something like 9. But let's be real here, we've probably all had a turn where we took unnecessary damage because we just didn't want to sit and do the math with our hand. In fact, I think this makes the power zone a really good indicator for a player's skill. If someone is able to consider the later turns at the very beginning of the game when they have a full life total, they probably are better than the person like myself who sometimes throws their hands up and goes, yeah, I'll take 10. The attitude to take unnecessary damage is probably why games quickly burn through the power zone into the caution zone. At 20 to 10 life, this is where players need to start evaluating their hands a lot better and start blocking a lot more. And it's no mystery as to why. When you're at 40 life, an enlightened strike for 7 doesn't seem like that much, but when you're at 20 life, well, that E strike is all of a sudden a third of your life total. Here's Johnny! This is a zone where blocking becomes more crucial and where being able to map out the value of yours and your opponent's plays becomes increasingly more important. If Dorinthia draws a hand that doesn't have any go again and she's already used her refraction bolters, she'll want to use more of her cards to block with, especially if Bravo doesn't dominate his attack. If you have no way to keep momentum or have a significant swing back at the opponent, you should trade your hand to conserve your life total for when you do have a better hand. Because this is another common mistake that I see players making. They take a bunch of extra damage just to send a mediocre attack back. And so this is the range where, for example, Bravo would start to block for 6 with 2 cards, and either use the tectonic plating and swinging a Nothos for 6, or just swinging the hammer for 4 and arsenaling a card if he's got something like a Crippling Crush that he couldn't use on that turn. This is also the zone where it becomes a lot more common to block with equipment. There are a lot of detrimental on hits in Flesh and Blood, and the ability to use equipment to prevent them from going off allows you to maintain a bit of tempo on your end. Command and Conquer becomes a lot less threatening when you can just use a Crown of Providence to tuck your arsenal and draw a card. To stop a dominated Crippling Crush, Dorinthia can use a 3 block card from hand, then block with her Skullcap and Courage for 2 each, and one with the last block on her Bracers. This puts her to block 8, taking 3 and avoiding the Crush effect. And now, she can use that other Iron Song determination she has in Arsenal with a Warrior's Valor, Iron Song Response, and a Blue Pitch in hand to push damage through. The hope here is to put Bravo on the back foot, presenting a consistent amount of damage every turn then on, forcing him to block for the rest of the game. And sometimes this is successful. You've probably seen games where one player stays at like 16 life because they were able to gain the tempo in this zone and managed to keep it for the rest of the game. Oftentimes though, the losing player is able to utilize one to two card hands to slowly drag their aggressors down in life total with them. 
Cards like Enlighten Strike and Wounded Bull are fantastic examples of two card hands, tucking or pitching a second card to attack for seven or eight, which is a significant amount of damage that either brings your opponent closer in life total or takes card from their hands, giving you a bit of breathing room. Meanwhile, Snatch and a weapon like Anothos are great examples of one card hands. Having a breakpoint of one damage means it either takes a defense reactions or two cards to block, otherwise you'll be leaking damage. And in Snatch's case, that on hit makes it even more incredible because it gives you a card to arsenal resulting in more resources for your next turn. The caution zone is where you start to see these kind of plays more often, where one player is on the defensive using most of their cards to block and just trying to get a substantial hit where they can. And the lower the life totals, the more important one to two card hands become, especially as players leave the caution zone and enter where the game starts to get really, really tense. The pressure zone is exactly as the name implies. This is the range of about 10 to 5 life where players are losing the ability to make a lot of their choices and you're going to be forced to block a lot more often. Gameplay here is incredibly tight and players take a lot less risks than they would have when they had higher life total. Two other aspects of Flesh and Blood that become more important in the pressure zone are attack reactions and the contents of both players' graveyards. Cards like Pummel or Shred become life-threatening, even if they don't kill you directly, and seeing what's in someone's graveyard can tell you a lot about what they could be threatening you with. Let's say Dorinthia is at 9 life and Bravo is at 10. Bravo is coming in with a crush confidence for 7, has a card in hand, and has 2 pitch floating. This scenario reeks of a pummel. And while he does have 3 reds in grave, he's been pitching the blues. And so this puts Dorinthia in a tight spot. She has a counter on the Dawn Blade, and her hand is a Glid the Quicksilver, Steel Blade Supremacy, Twinning Blade, and a Blue Pitch. This is the perfect setup to push back at Bravo, and if it was just the 7, she could go to 2 and be fine since the on hit doesn't matter with the Twinning Blade. But the threat of a Pummel means death, and so she has to block with at least one card. But even this presents a major problem, because the Pummel would also rip a card out of her hand, meaning she'd just take 6 damage and still go to 2 cards. The last option would then to be block for 9, delaying the Pummel and keeping herself at 9. And so after weighing up the options, Dorinthia decides to block with the Steel Blade Supremacy, going to 4 and chancing the Pummel. However, in this scenario, there's no Pummel. Bravo was bluffing, hoping for an overblock, so now he simply arsenals and passes turn. When you're at lower life, your options become very limited, and you start having to make plays that you'd rather not have to. But that's the beauty of Flesh and Blood. You have to make do with what you have, and you have to assess all of the possibilities, and sometimes take a risk. Thankfully for Dory, this worked out in her favor. Now she gets to come back with the Dawn Blade, using Glint the Quicksilver and Twinning Blade to attack twice, both for four. This doesn't kill Bravo, but it does make him stop and consider his own hand's value in order to figure out the ideal amount to block and still be able to apply pressure. Worried about a plus three attack reaction, Bravo blocks the first swing with two cards and the last point on his Crater Fist, but Dory just plays the Glint and Twinning combo and swings again for four, forcing Bravo to use another card in his Tectonic Plating to fully block. This does remove the Dawn Blade counter, but doesn't let Bravo have a full attack back. However, he did manage to keep a blue pitch, so he does swing on his turn with the Anothos for four, not letting Dory take full advantage. And so now as the life totals start to dwindle, both players enter the final stage of the game. The kill zone is just the best part of Flesh and Blood. Let's be real, we have all had that game where you and the opponent both get to one and you're just leveraging back and forth, trying to get that hit in. You're both swinging with blues and your weapons and you're just trying to get that last point of damage until one of you finally, finally gets it. And you're just rushed with adrenaline and excited. And this is the absolute highlight of Flesh and Blood. But it's also the most terrifying and players can make some serious mistakes just based on nerves alone. The kill zone is where the one to two card hands become king. And it's where weapons like the harmonized Kadachis go from being just annoying to actual life threatening damage where you're forced to block them with entire cards. The ability to take damage to swing back is very minimal and you at best might be able to take half a hit and only once. The moment you go to one, every single thing in the game becomes lethal. And you better hope your opponent didn't pitch that many attack reactions earlier because that will spell complete disaster. The absolute and undisputed queen of the kill zone has to be Prism Sculptor of Arclight. She could create an end game board state that could just attack five times with auras. If the opponent was at one, they were just dead. One card that really stands out here is Snatch, which I mentioned earlier because of that break point and the draw effect. But really any zero for four attack is great here because forcing your opponent to block one damage with a whole extra card can help lean the tempo in your favor. 
A huge part of the kill zone is to get your opponent to one and force them to block every bit of damage. This is actually what makes the Rosetta Thorn such an overpowered weapon, dealing two physical and two arcane damage. If a Rune Blade is putting on the pressure and is able to use at least three cards in hand, this weapon spells almost certain death, especially if the opponent only has one source of arcane barrier. Split damage is incredibly efficient at closing out a game. But thankfully for Bori and Davo, god damn it. But thankfully for Dorian Bravo, Prism is gone and there's no Rune Blade to ruin this game with Rosetta Thorn. But the weapons do matter here because Anothos and the Dawn Blade were not made equally. The Dawn Blade is a great weapon, if you can acquire a counter or two on it, but its base rate is 1 for 3 damage, which is one whole card for 3 damage. This is below rate when you consider a card like Scar for a Scar is one card for 4 damage. And while Anothos does cost 3 to swing, it's still just a whole blue card for that 4 damage. And so after Bravo blocked out the Dawn Blade, Dory is in a super tight situation. She wasn't able to gain the tempo back, and now he's at 2 and she's at 1. Her weapon can be blocked by 1 card, but Bravo's has to be blocked by 2, and and since she's at one, she can no longer afford to take any extra damage. And this is the true nature of the kill zone. When you're at low life, you can't afford to take damage. And so you're forced to block, hoping that your opponent loses tempo by drawing a bad hand. However, Dorinthia isn't out yet because both her and Bravo have been pitching attack reactions the entire game. Dorinthia's being blue iron song responses and Bravo's being blue pummels. And Bravo just drew the hand he needed. Two blue pummels and two blue guardian attacks, both over three cost. This hand could end the game with just the two attacks and one of the blue pummels. Anothos would swing for four, which would be blocked by two cards. Then the pummel would give plus two with another plus two from Anothos' effect. This would win him the game for sure, but his extra extra card is also a pummel, blocking only for two. Thankfully though, Bravo's at two, and so when Dorinthia attacks with the Dawn Blade, he just blocks with the pummel, going to one. Uh, yeah, uh, Iron Song response for one? This is why Mother doesn't love you. Managing the resource that is your life total in Flesh and Blood is difficult and nuanced. Oftentimes, it's correct to try and stay ahead of your opponent in life, especially if you're playing an aggressive rushdown deck like Fi or Viscerai. If you can manage to stay in the caution zone while your opponent is in the kill zone, well, that's just great for you. But other decks like Islander would rather play it a bit slower, blocking more and utilizing cards that actually benefit you for having lower life, like Scar for a Scar, Heart of Fiendal, and Wounded Bolt. So while I think it's important to pay attention to your life total and know what zone you're in, I also think it's very important to understand the kind of deck you're playing and where it functions best. But no matter the deck, if you're at low life total, you will almost always have less cards to attack back with. So whether you're in the power zone or the pressure zone, it more often makes sense to use a bad hand to block so you can maintain your life total to be used as a resource later when you do have a good hand. While the magic you'll pay life to gain some more mana, and in Yu-Gi-Oh you'll pay life to directly counter something, Flesh and Blood has you paying life to keep your cards, aka resources, for the turn, so you can then interact with your opponent, hopefully disrupting theirs. It's a subtle difference, but it is part of why Flesh and Blood plays differently to other games. Almost every single turn cycle has you leveraging life total as a resource, and giving up too much early game can cost you down the line. And it's a very rewarding aspect of the game to learn and master. Oftentimes in Flesh and Blood, a single point of damage can be the entire determining factor. In this game, you can't just willy-nilly give up your life for a bunch of cards in order to build a board state to kill your opponent with. You have to manage what you're given. When both players get to constantly refresh their resources, you have to play more of a back and forth game. And honestly, I think that's part of what makes Flesh and Blood really, really cool. If you like this video and wanted to support me, consider checking out my Patreon. There's extra bonuses like Talishar card sleeves, early access to videos, and even your own Giga Chat card. And to those who are already supporting me, you have my undying thanks. It's because of chads like you that I can continue to do what I do. So please, stay chadly, my friends.